So, Dr. Cohen, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate you hopping on the podcast here. You are one of our first ever guests, so uh, thanks for your time. Um, I'm sure this is way up there as far as your lists of awards and honors, right? Prestigious uh, accomplishments. Um, but if you could uh, just tell us a little bit, give us a little bit about your background. Tell us a little bit about yourself for our listeners here. Yeah, I mean, first off, I'm excited and honored, you know, to be on the podcast and to be one of the, we'll call it the early adopters of yes. uh, of your podcast. And I'm, I'm sure it's only going to grow. So thank you for asking me to do it. I'm really pumped for today's discussion. I think it's going to be be fun. I'm, I think I'll learn a ton too uh, during this talk. So thanks again for for asking me. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Um, anything you want to give us about your professional background and what you're doing currently, uh, Dr. Cohen, for our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm a hip and knee replacement surgeon at University of Orthopedics. Uh, I'm in my sixth year of practice. I'm currently the uh, co-fellowship director. So we uh, teach uh, orthopedic uh, fellows who have graduated residency and are now training just to do hip and knee replacement. And so they come from all over the country to spend a year with us. And uh, I, I lead that group. And then I'm the direct co-director of the Miriam Total Joint Center, uh, which is a phenomenal facility that does a lot, a lot of hip and knee replacements, both primary and complex uh, surgeries, um, really outstanding nurses, has a dedicated uh, floor called Three North that's just uh, uh, focused on hip and knee replacements, uh, which I think has a, has given a, our patients a great recovery. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as my practice goes, I do about 50% of my practice is same day surgery. So patients go in the same, going home the same day after hip and knee replacement. And then um, another part of my practice is complex hip and knee, either primaries, meaning first time or revision surgeries. Um, on the hip side, I do the anterior approach, which is everyone likes to talk about and, and a lot of people come to see me for. Um, yes. And, uh, you know, is, is I think a unique approach that, you know, has really evolved over the past 10 to 15 years and uh, has become really ubiquitous with hip replacements and and uh, its popularity, you know, has continued to kind of skyrocket. And yeah. I think for a lot of the reasons we'll talk today, these patients seem to do, re they do really, really well. Um, and then, you know, I do uh, partial knee replacements and uh, uh, full knee replacements as well. Right. Okay, great. So uh, you touched on, you kind of served the softball up for me here already. So I appreciate that uh, laying the table here. But um, you were one of the first ones in our practice to really do or kind of pioneer. It's been around for a while, but the, the direct anterior hip. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about some of the technical side of things is for our listeners that may not be familiar as far as direct anterior approach versus the traditional posterior lateral approach and also some of your philosophy as far as what are some of the pros and cons with each yeah so i think you know talking about the anterior approach this you know the first thing i would talk about is you know one of my mentors rick limbird um who was a part of this group and and retired and really a lot of the reasons i went into hip and knee replacement um was because of uh you know rick limpert and the anterior hip replacement because i got to see that there was really unique advantages to it and so um what it is is about a three inch incision on the front of the hip instead of on the back of the hip and i go through uh in between the natural interval so it's a a, a natural inner nervous um uh, plain meaning we're not cutting any nerves and it's uh, intermuscular meaning we're not cutting any muscles so there's a natural plane uh, between the tensor and sartorius uh, muscle um, superficially and then as you go deep into the hip you can just spread the muscles apart and we're you know in a deep interval between the rectus and the glute media so again don't have to cut any of the muscles and that's different from the other approaches uh, the lateral approach, which is from the side where you you cut part of the glute medius to access the hip and the posterior lateral approach where you uh, split the glute maximus uh, to access the hip. So I get to access the hip joint um, by not cutting those muscles. Another advantage is the patient is supine or meaning lying flat rather than lying on their side. 
And so I can bring in a uh, fluoroscopic image or basically real time X ray um, during the case. So I can check a lot of things. I can check my cup position. I can check where my hip implant is. I can check my leg links. I can check uh, hip offset, which is from the basically the center of the femoral head to the greater trochanter, which that is um, what tensions your muscles and can add to additional stability. So basically, my goal going into it with this with this um, surgery is to restore your own native anatomy, and I can do that more accurately um, with the anterior approach for those reasons. So that's really what got me excited about it. We have a lot of we have we have several guys in our group that also do it, and they're great, uh, and they've been doing it for a while too. Um, some of the things that um, I've kind of continued to take to the next level is revisions through the anterior approach. Uh, so traditionally, revisions have been through the posterior approach, um, meaning the back of the hip and. Um, I started out with smaller revision hip replacements uh, through the front of the hip and then have continued to progress to full revisions through the front of the hip and a lot of the same reasons for a lot of the same advantages that uh, they have for primary you can get um, in the appropriate patient with a revision as well. So for some revision cases I can uh, do uh, that people can go home the same day or next day. Um, by doing this uh, type type of approach. And again, I get to use x-rays, which I think is an additional advantage uh, during surgery. Um, you know, that being said, there are some people that um, may not be candidates for for that approach based on anatomy or some other factors or maybe the, and, and sometimes there is an advantage to do another approach for revision surgery and I'll do those as well. I've, I do every approach uh, to the hip and really I try to decide, you know, what it gives the best advantage for the patient and myself during the surgery to get the optimal outcome. And that's how I'll decide, you know, which approach to do for which revision surgery. Got it. So just for our listeners, what would be some of the factors that might exclude someone from being a candidate for the anterior direct approach anatomically or other considerations? Yeah, I think in general for a first time hip replacement or primary hip replacement, uh, I, I, I see all comers and do all comers through the anterior approach. I'm comfortable with some of the complex primary surgeries. There are some situations where patients have prior hardware um, that are present um, that there may be an advantage or it was placed, you know, through a different approach and to get it out you know, through um, it may be advantage, advantageous to use that same approach that it was put in, you know, the, or the original surgery was put in with. Uh, so there's, you know, certain certain advantages there. And that's what I mean, you know, kind of taking the whole picture and deciding what's best uh, for the patient, for the surgery, for the optimal outcome. I don't think, you know, there's not one um, one box that everyone fits in, into. Sure. So the nice thing is having trained and do all these approaches, I, I do them all. Um, but the vast majority are anterior. And I'm correct in just kind of blowing down saying too that from a surgical standpoint that the anterior approach is maybe a little more technically challenging just because of the femoral artery nerve vein that are running through there or do you find that you know that maybe it's not it, compare. I, I'm just comparing it to some of the other approaches. I'll say. I'll, I'll yeah. put it that way. Yeah. I think that's a super in interesting question, and and I get it a lot. And I'll tell you, I think you know, early on, if you look at the data with anterior approach hip replacement, what you found was a lot higher complication rates and um, um, you know problems with the anterior approach. And that's what you'll hear from you know other other people um, mm. as the anterior approach has evolved. I think a lot of those problems have been solved. Um, you know, and, and I'm talking 10, 15 years ago. So sure. the early adopters, you know, you were using um, implants that were made to put it in through a different approach. They weren't made for anterior approach. We now have instruments and implants that are made for the anterior approach, which have actually allowed me to use even smaller incisions and less, you know, releases of tissues um, to do the actual surgery. So those, that's the one end. And the other end is, surgeons going through training weren't being exposed to the anterior approach or people adopting the anterior approach had been doing you know a different way for 20 years and then you go to this approach and everything looks a little different it's it's basically kind of turned on its head because uh, you're going to the hip through the front not the back now i think that's changing because we have 
orthopedic residents and fellows, like the fellows that come and work with us, they're seeking out anterior approach, they're getting the exposure, and what you're seeing is the adoption rate of anterior approach is going even higher. And so I think it is in some ways a little more technical um, than a posterior approach hip, but um, that gap is being bridged with more education and more exposure. And so I think, you know, I think people are adopting it a lot easier than they were before, because now we have the education, we have the instruments, we have the courses, all these things weren't necessarily available, you know, when you, when you talk about 10, 15 years, years ago when it first kind of got started. Yeah, and logically, selfishly, from a rehab provider standpoint, <laughs> you know, if there's a way to spare the glutes, uh, you know, I think that logically makes great sense, especially as far as patients go, you know, from that standpoint. So, you know, just that, anything you can do to try to minimize the trauma there uh, is is helpful. But on that note, what would you say as far as complications or, or trouble, what kind of difficulties to see some of the anterior patients might run into from a rehab standpoint for some of our listeners? Yeah, no, I think I think that's a good question. Um, you know, yeah, there definitely is advantages when you look at six, six week early outcomes, functional outcomes. There's several studies that really support, uh, you know, early return to normal gait, um, early return to activities with the anterior approach. And that's, you know, as we have rehabs that are kind of driving, um, you know, accelerated rehabs, driving patients forward. Everyone wants to get back to doing what they want to do. That really has its advantages. Now, I'll tell you that when I have family members call or friends and family call from, you know, out of state and they say, hey, I'm seeing a surgeon, this surgeon does posterior approach, you know, what do you think? I tell them, well, do they do a lot of them? Uh, are they experienced? You know, and what's their reputation? How, how, how are their outcomes in the community? And if it's that they're, you know, Great surgeon does a posterior approach and is a you know fellowship trained high volume surgeon. I said you know it doesn't in my opinion it doesn't matter you know long term outcomes don't change if it's done well long term outcomes will be good with any approach and so that's probably the most important take home is that you know volume um, of surgeries done uh, is probably the best predictor of you know final. I'll just call that final outcome. Now, anterior pro each, you know, each surgery has its advantages and disadvantages. Right. With the anterior approach, the only thing I'll say is that I really try to slow my patients down from hip flexion exercises yeah. because, like I was talking about the intervals, we work in between the muscles, but we're still, you know, we have to spread the muscles to access the hip. And so they're more sensitive. And so we're working, uh, we're spreading the rectus out of the way. The psoas tendon is, you know, right there as well, spread it out of the way. And so all, you know, the tensor is, you know, spread out of the way. So all those muscles on the front of the hip, that's what allows you to flex your hip up. Um, and so I have patients avoid that for the first six weeks because I find if they're doing a lot of high knee, high hip flexion exercises, they can sometimes irritate those muscles and it can cause like a groin pain and a, and a slower recovery. So by slowing them down uh, the first couple of weeks on the front end, I think they catch up on the back end uh, uh, with that. Now, that being said, you know, there's other reasons you can have, you know, hip flexion pain or psoas pain uh, too. You know, there could be uh, rubbing on the implants. Um, I think, you know, one of my approaches and one of the, I think, advantage advantages for you know, uh, the answer approach and the way I do it is that the, um, Cups in general, the size of the cup tends to be a little smaller with an anterior approach. I think you have fluoroscopic image and x-ray, really good direct visualization of the acetabulum or the cup when you're doing the surgery. And so, and you have added stability, which we which we haven't got into, but there's a lower risk of dislocation with this approach, both in primary and revisions. It's been proven in several studies. Uh, another big advantage uh, for it. Um, but so we don't need as big a, as bigger cups. And I try to stay small on the cup side and really make sure there's coverage on the uh, circumferentially around the cup, especially on the top where the psoas tendon runs over, uh, again, to prevent, you know, rubbing of the tendon on the metal cup, uh, which can cause, you know, in long term pain as well. Yeah, I agree. I, anecdotally, I mean, it just seems across the board, whether we're talking, you know, total hip or even just hip arthroscopy for FAI stuff, it seems like those anterior structures tend to be potentially, you know, a little more irritable. And when they do get flared, tend to stay 
flared for a little longer, which definitely can make it challenging from a rehab standpoint. So yeah, yeah, I totally yeah. agree. Once yeah. they get irritated, it can take months to recover, take a couple months, and it can be very frustrating. Uh, I think for you know the physical therapist, of course, the patient and the surgeon, because everyone you know wants the patient to get better, and then they're kind of dealing with this residual kind of groin hip flexion pain. So yeah, I think it, you know ways to focus to you know any way you can focus to calm it down is probably you know probably uh, uh, most important. Sure. How about in in comparison to some of the other hip approaches? What are your thoughts on? range of motion limitations, things that might stress that anterior hip motions like extension, external rotation. What's your philosophy on how much those need to be limited and for how long? Just uh, just for our listeners. Yeah, I try to keep it simple. I tell my patients I have two rules. Number one, no falls, right? Yeah. If you fall, yeah. you can break something. That could lead in revision surgery. Your hip will never be the same. So take it slow. No falls is number one rule. Number two, no pivoting. Uh, so, you know, it's really extension, external rotation is what I have them avoid. I had them avoid that for three months. Three months. Uh, it's probably a little conservative, um, uh, but, you know, I I like to think of this as like kind of slow and steady wins the race. And um, once you're healed, you know, you can pretty much do most things, almost everything. And so, you know, um, just a couple of months to rec- uh, taking it easy is, is not, a, not always a bad thing. Yeah, sure. A lot easier to fix a stiff hip than it is a dislocated hip, right? So <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct, correct. And, sure. and really, hips, hips, hips really rarely, you know, are actually like stiff, you know. Um, right. And so you, you know, it's not not as a con- biggest concern on the hip side. Yeah. So tell me, you mentioned some of the differences um, with revisions versus primary surgery. Tell us from a rehab standpoint what if you could kind of give one take home or one message to rehab providers with the revision surgeries versus primaries what would you what would you suggest to them well i think the take home is if there's ever any question on a revision surgery just reach out to the surgeon uh because each revision surgery can be pretty different you know yeah um and and it can be you know smaller from what i call you know what we call a headliner change which is just changing the modular implant sometimes the plastic can wear out you know 20 years down the road someone had a hip replacement now the plastic the uh, polyethylene which snaps into the cup can wear out and changing that out is a much smaller revision than like doing someone with massive bone loss and reconstructing their entire acetabulum where maybe they're not allowed to walk on it for a couple months until till that heals. So I think, yeah, number one is I think just, you know, reach out if there's ever any questions about the about the rehab, you know, for the revision. And number two is that in general, revision hip surgery is higher, higher risk of dislocation than primary. I mean, this, you know, primary like anterior hip replacement risk of the dislocation of the hip popping out is like 0.5% or, you know, or maybe even lower. Um, you look at some of the other approaches, it could be up to, you know, one to two to three percent. But revision surgeries, regardless, are like, you know, you, you can put that up to like a 10 percent risk. And so much stricter on on range of motion on a revision surgery, uh, regardless of approach than, um, than it would be on a primary. Sure. OK, I, so I don't want to make it seem like the only thing you do is hips. <laughs> you mentioned uh, that you know, you do knees as well. So why don't we shift gears for a minute, if you could. And obviously, you know, knees, there's a little less variability, right, with ways to do a total knee, um, but different prostheses and that kind of thing. But tell us, again, for our rehab audience here, um, if you had one factor or consideration, what do you, what would you say influences outcomes following a total knee the most for, for your patients? Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a great question. You know, total knee uh, replacement's a wonderful operation that uh, can really help a lot of people. And there is a subset of people, I think, that struggle with the recovery after knee replacement. I think most importantly, you know, it's going in with uh, with a good attitude and a, and a can-do attitude, both on the surgeon side and the patient side. Um, and then the second thing I would say is, you know, you'll see this kind of a theme throughout my philosophy here is that it's a marathon, not a sprint. And knee replacements, you know, you you have the surgery, you haven't, we give you a nerve block. We do a lot of things to really kind of minimize your pain after surgery. So day one, two can be pretty good. 
but day three, four, five are usually really tough. And so it's because the nerve blocks wear off. You also are now more mobile, and so you can have increased swelling. And knees, uh, a knee is a thin, thinner structure. So I think, you know, you can feel pain a little more than, say, like a hip, which is a deep, really deep structure, right? You can, you can feel your knee, but you can't reach down and feel your hip. And so right. it's more sensitive to those things. So I would say, you know, it's kind of like a slow process. Ice, ice, ice is really the most important and taking it, you know, you want to work with your therapist um, and do the exercises, work on the quad sets, the ankle pumps, the mobility, the gait training, but you're not really going to hit it really hard with the knee, um, you know, until after you're past that day five, you know, and you kind of have things under control um, from a swelling, pain, recovery standpoint. So, you know, you'll hear everyone's different. You'll hear lots of different um recovery stories you know and so it's and it's also probably the third thing i would say is not to put yourself in a box not to you know read the facebook group or the group you know um, you know or the group you know uh online and each recovery is different it's the end goal that we're looking for we're looking at in general i look for zero so flat flat full extension and 90 degrees at your first post-op visit which is usually two two and a half weeks um, if you're not quite there we'll usually have you come back at four, uh, four weeks later at six weeks because that like six to 12 week mark is a, also an opportunity that if there is a problem or with your motion um there's an opportunity to address that with the manipulation under anesthesia which also isn't a big deal um and all it is is you get a little medicine to go to sleep in the operating room and as the surgeon we manipulate your knee and kind of break up any scar tissue that you might be forming to kind of help you get over that hump um it's not like a badge of of anything it's not yeah. uh, you know it it uh, really is not a big deal it's some people just need a little extra uh, range of motion and that can get you an extra 10 15 degrees of range of motion by doing that so we kind of try to keep track it track of the patient within three months and work closely with the physical therapist because after that knee manipulation i'll have the patient try to come in like every day right. at least for the first week to kind of keep keep that momentum going yeah so tell me this then on that note with the stiff patient or the patient you think is a candidate for manipulation or anesthesia is there like a cutoff in your mind where if they don't have sufficient whatever you feel like the benchmark is for range of motion by week 12 you would rather kind of be on the early side to do the surgery or are you okay with waiting a bit to manipulate like what's your philosophy with that because i like I, to do it there's some diverse opinions so yeah i like to do it within 12 weeks now there is yep. there is a study that shows you can do it after three months um uh my buddy nick Colaccio in maine actually published that um i i think it, it gets pretty stiff after three months and it's a yep. little harder to do and probably a little higher risk of complications uh one sure. one potential complication is is a fracture or a break you know of the femur um which 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 we don't want and so i like to get it i like to be there early um yeah. uh, for that but you can do it later um there's not like a hard cutoff with range of motion in general it's like 110 115 is pretty functional knee range of motion that yeah. allows you to do stairs um I've had patients that I've had the conversation with that had a little less and they were happy with it. They didn't have pain and they were very mobile and they opted, you know, not to. And, yeah. and I think, you know, understanding that, you know, this is kind of like now's the time or, or you, or, or you, I think you probably can't. And so, um, you know, having that conversation, so I don't have any hard, um, hard cutoffs, but, you know, in general, we're looking for 110, 115 to do stairs. And right. so that's that's kind of where I look at. So if someone's, you know, at 90 at, at six or seven weeks, um, you'd, you'd have a I think having a conversation that, hey, we can probably get you that extra, you know, 10, 15, 20 degrees, you know, or even at 100 degree, you know, if that 100 getting that extra 10, 15 that would allow you to, you know, do stairs one at a time. Um, um, I'll kind of kind of say, you know, let's let's think about this, you know, right. So tell me on at your office, Bob, if you had to kind of pick one or rank them, what would you say? What's the most common impairment you see in terms of patients that are struggling? What what where do they struggle the most? Is it with extension? Is it with flexion? Is it quad weeks? Is, you know, 
Um, and, you know, every patient is different. That's a good sure. question. You know, a lot of it, a lot of it is like what happened, where they're at, where are they at pre-op? Um, yeah. And so someone with a, you know, 20 degree knee flexion contracture, you know, and, you know, it's 20 to 70 range of motion, you know, that they're the ones that are going to have, you know, be more likely to get a knee flexion contracture again. I actually, I do think I, I, I love it when patients have established themselves with a physical therapist before a knee replacement, like um, a prehab or a like pre-op. a prehab. Yeah. Because sure. then, you know, as a physical therapist, you have kind of an idea where they're coming from too. And that's what I mean. Like I have some patients that maybe have, you know, they may have less range of motion, but they are really happy because you don't yeah. know where they were, you know, you may not know where they were at before, right? They're like a hundred million times better than they were at before. And so, um, you know, everything is a little relative, you know, even when we're talking about knee replacements too. And so, um, it is nice when, when someone has an established physical therapist that they go to before, kind of like a prehab, um, you build rapport with the therapist. And then, you know, I've kind of planned to schedule that back. I think that's, it's, um, it's a lot easier for you as a physical therapist to coach them as well, because you saw, you've saw them before. So, you know, yeah. where they're coming from and maybe, you know, you can anticipate, uh, some of the, some of their, their issues as well. Sure. Yeah. I mean, everybody's own individual value judgment is going to be a little different, right? As far as it's going to be a little different or they're going to, you know, that's what they're going to, you know, going to struggle with the person with yeah. the big flexion traction is going to, you know, no matter what we do, we, I'll tell you, we get it straight in the OR, you know, the hamstrings are going to pull, they're going to want to come back. They may yeah. be a little spastic <laughs> or tight. Right yeah. Yeah. They, and, and, and so, you know, um, uh, knowing, knowing that before the beforehand is helpful. So, yeah, I think the vast majority of patients, you know, do really well. We're talking, we're talking the nuances of some of the um, nuances of a knee replacement and some of the people who, who struggle a little bit, but I think, you know, making a kind of patient specific approach is probably what's most important. Sure. So, I mean, that's a good segue into my next question for you, which is like, if there was one take home point that you would like rehab providers to think about or really stress when it came to treating your patients. What would you say? What would you suggest to them? Yeah, I mean that's that's all. That's a hard question. Hard, I, I will say yeah, I know. the one one thing that's probably you know I care about probably more at getting at the two, three, even four week range is full extension. Right. Okay. Right. It's easier to get flexion. Like it, we'd you know it's easier for the patient to get flexion. It's easier because I think because of the hamstring pull, it's easier to um, which goes both ways. Um, it's easier to, do, you can't do a knee manipulation for a lack of full extension. You know, you just really, right. really can't, you can do it for flexion. Um, and p I see, I've seen people catch up on the back end on flexion. I haven't seen them catch up on the back end, you know, meaning later on in the rehab with lack of full extension. You know, we're talking about trying to use, you know, the brace, the braces, um, to, to help with full extension or, you know, the dyna splints or dynamic splints, you know, so I think like, you know, a big focus is, you know, you want them to get their full extension early. And then I think you can get the, and also it, it, that doesn't put as much stress on the swelling of the knee or the pain in the knee, and then they can get, you know, flexion, um, not saying not to work on flexion, just no, full sure. extension is really, I think, I think underappreciated and really important. What is your feel? You because you mentioned manipulation under anesthesia. What's your feeling? Do you have like an algorithm or kind of a set philosophy as far as manipulation under anesthesia versus a patient that might get arthroscopic lysis of adhesions, that kind of thing? Or which? How do you kind of differentiate? Yeah, it's a good question. I I'm I'm not a huge uh, proponent of. Lysis of adhesions, yeah. uh, arthroscopically, I, I I don't do it. I do manipulations under anesthesia and have that conversation early. Um, you know, it's an additional. That's more invasive. It's additional surgery, um, and I'm not sure the results are much better than knee manipulation under anesthesia. Um, you know, um, I can see maybe you know maybe some of the benefit if you like release a little more of the PCL um to help with flexion or something like that but um it is invasive it's additional surgeries additional risk of infection right. um and so i i am not a big proponent of right. of that and then after three months it, you know if you're not if you if if there's a is a problem first off 
he can still get gains up to a year. You know, I think we've all seen people continue to improve. So mm-hmm. I would say both for therapists and patients to not be discouraged. Everyone gets better at their own pace. But, you know, if there's a real issue with uh, stiffness um, after a year, then there are discussions for like revision surgery. Although, uh, like I tell everybody who has, you know, if they, if they come see me for a second opinion with a stiff, you know, stiff, painful total knee, the risk of stiffness after revision surgery, if you've had stiffness, is stiffness. Uh, there are so there are a we're talking again. We're talking about a very small percentage. You're talking, you know, zero point five percent. There are probably a subset of people who form more scar than others, um, and it's not a trying problem or showing up to physical therapy problem or an right. implant problem. It's that they may form more scar, you know, than than others. And I think in the future, you know, we may be able to genetic test for that or figure that out ahead of time. Right. And then maybe address that in a different way. Um, you know, there's also some, you know, some research into different medicines that can prevent scarring right. after surgery. And so that may be a, you know, a future, I think a lot of the innovation knee replacement comes with that kind of, that kind of um, innovation. Um, and so, you know, because th- again, that's a, a small subset, um, but it's definitely, definitely on my mind. That's, that's something we can learn more about. Sure. So tell us a little bit about this evolution you know we see post-surgical kind of stay times getting shorter and shorter tell us a little bit if you could about the evolution of kind of going from the overnight stay towards same day surgery and what you kind of see on the horizon with that and what you see outcome wise if you could yeah it's really it's really been amazing so there's been three both the surgery center uh has been around for a long time rich burger in chicago really pioneered that you know he's been doing that probably 15 years um but it really caught on it started to catch on over the past uh five years and then with covid uh happening and hospitals being closed down really no one um wanted to go to the hospital for surgery and everyone wanted to go home so it really accelerated this um this idea that you can go home after hip and knee replacement and there was a consulting group that came out and it's like sg2 consulting group came out with this graph it's a really neat graph and it talked about the number of outpatient total joints um per year by 2026 so we're almost we're actually almost there 2024 so two years from now they said 50 percent of patients would would be outpatient total joints so half of patients having surgery would be outpatient total joints Two, three years ago, like when I first saw this, I thought, oh, man, that's kind of that's an overestimation. You know, it's an overestimate, you know, of what can happen. Well, I'm all I'm already doing about half my patients go home the same day. Yeah. And so now when I look at that, I think, well, I, that might be an underestimate estimate of how many people are going to go home same day by 2026. You know, it's probably, you know, upward 65, 70 percent. Uh, patients with a first time hip or knee replacement will be able to go home same day. There's a, so it's, a, it was been an evolution and the evolution is, yeah, COVID I think played a role. Uh, anesthesia uh, plays a role. We do a lot more under short acting spinal anesthesia. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, nerve blocks play a role. Um, physical therapy plays a role because we, we get up patients within an hour after surgery, yeah, right? Yeah. So early mobilization, um, you're not, you're not sitting in a, in a bed where your muscles, you know, just sitting in a bed for a half day, your muscles are wasting away. Just right. Yeah. So getting up, getting up right away, actually it's been shown early mobilization helps pain, helps the range of motion we're talking about as well. And so, and then what I think patients have realized is there's no place like home to recover. Um, you know, it, you, but you're home and yes, you could have some, uh, pain or discomfort, uh, whether you're in a hospital or home, but at least you're home and, you know, you can kind of have access to whatever makes you comfortable, whether it's a book or Netflix or your favorite, you know, couch or recliner or your favorite food, uh, your home. And so, and you're with your loved ones. And so I think patients have seen that and had had really good experiences. And as a result, what's happened is, you know, someone who I've done a same day surgery two, three years ago, now 
maybe their other hip is bothering them or their other knee is bothering them and that's what they're choosing to do they're, they said well or you know a family member uh, had went home or a friend had went home and they said well my friend and family member did this and so i'm going to go home and so it really the adoption um has been really positive and and a good experience i think for for everybody you know to go home after a joint replacement okay good i'm gonna i'm gonna do the deep dive question now <laughs> so because you just mentioned the evolution of kind of the trend of same day surgery if you could tell us one thing because you mentioned you've been in practice six years right? or six years six years um tell us is there anything where your thinking has evolved or you've changed your mind on a certain position or topic within those six years professionally from when you started? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I kind of alluded to it a little bit, so I'll take the yeah. easy way out here, but uh, okay. <laughs> I think, you know, the same day adoption, um, you know, what is possible with going home same day, I think is totally different. So when I was in residency, patients would stay three days in the hospital. Right. You know, three days and then they some would go home and some would go to a nursing home. Um, now, you know, pretty they leave the same day overnight, leave the next day. Pretty much over 90 percent of people are going home and then the amount that are going home same day. You know, I used to think, wow, that's like, you know, it'd be a small percentage that would go home same day. Now, you know, here we are 2024, 50 percent are going home same day. And I'm thinking, well, what's the, you know, where are we at now? Probably 70%, you know, is where we're at as far as that goes. Um, you know, and then, you know, the evolution of anterior approach, I think, has is really evolved in the past, you know, five years. Yeah. And the implants and the innovations happening in that space has been probably the most dramatic. Um, and so, you know, that's made provisions possible um you know that that maybe weren't as you know easy uh or as um you know straightforward before a lot more uh with with the appropriate instruments and implants are 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 easier to do um or um you know made to be done through an anterior approach now that maybe weren't and so that was something that you know in training wasn't going on that now is going on on a regular basis uh, so that's kind of kind of been an evolution as well. OK, thanks. Um, I've taken up a big chunk of your time here, so I don't want to take too much more. I do have another question. If you're for our listeners, is there one key takeaway based on the discussion today that you would like them to kind of leave with as far as treating your patients and anything from a rehab perspective? Yeah, I, I mean, I like to think I'm pretty accessible and, um, you know, I think one takeaway and I've had a, a lot of conversation with physical therapists, you know, in the area is that if. Like we want to hear from you and, and let us know. Um, uh, you you guys are, you know, essential part of the care team and the patient's recovery and uh, we we feel that we feel strongly about that and and want to hear from you if there's a if there's a problem question or concern um, so we can uh, help you address it uh, so I think that's like one key takeaway you know from from this talk um, and then you know the other other key takeaway is that you know hip and knee replacements are continuing to evolve and but every patient is is different and um, I think what you what you and your team already do, uh, but is that taking a patient specific approach, both in surgery and therapy is probably the most important uh, for their outcome. Right, great. I'm going to go off script here, so I'm apologizing. <laughs> for, yeah, for no. last, but tell yeah. us for our listeners, tell us uh, one thing about Dr. Eric Cohen that might not be on the University of Orthopedics website. Tell us something a little personal about yourself that uh, our listeners might not know. Yeah, well, I, I'll just, you know, I'll say that, that um, you know, I have a wonderful wife and three small kids, um, five, four, and one and a half that, you know, keep me, you know, busy out of work and definitely probably keep me more on my toes. Uh, it's definitely yeah. easier going to work and doing hip replacements than, uh, <laughs> right. you know, than sometimes uh, the weekends are, uh, but they're a lot of fun. And then, you know, when, when I am home and we have a Friday night off and it's nice, we like to you know, make pizza. So yeah. uh, between me and my wife, I think we're a pretty good pizza uh, pizza team. So, you know, if uh, hip replacements don't work out, you know, we might be 
putting up your local pizza joint. All right, awesome. Now, is are we doing like grilled pizza, or we have like a special oven? Like, what's the yeah? Yeah, I do it. I do it on an uni oven, but uh, I'm I want to branch out. You know, um, the most important part is the dough. Uh, oh, and making yeah. your own dough. So a shout out to Alfornos. We use Alfornos cookbook for the dough recipe. Okay. Um, the great, it's really a great cookbook. One of our, uh, you know, favorite cookbooks. And so, um, yeah, we use the, the dough recipe is probably the most important and being patient with the dough. Um, and then it'll make anything taste good. All right. Awesome. So no Khaleesi uh, store-bought dough for you. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very no, much, Dr. Cohen. No, I appreciate your no. time today. This was great. Yeah, thank you. It was fun. On. It was great. All right. You take care. Have a great night.